Let's go! It's time for Mass with Mr. Thomas. Chapter 14, lesson number 4, moving on to look at proof by contradiction. Once again, for this chapter, you need to be familiar with the different number sets. You need to know that N is your natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. W is your whole numbers, which also includes 0. Z is going to be your set of integers, your positive or negative whole numbers. Q is rational numbers, numbers that can be written as a fraction. Look at these examples here. And R is going to be a real numbers, which is all numbers, apart from going into complex numbers. Moving on then to proof by contradiction. First of all, what is a contradiction? Anybody help me out? Go on, Blake. Perfect. It is a collection of statements that oppose one another. Miranda, can you give me an example? Perfect, yes. You could say that Lucy is married to Sam, but Sam is not married to Lucy. This would be a contradiction because you're saying Lucy's married to Sam, but then you're also saying that Sam is not married to Lucy. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Proof by contradiction, what's that all about? Well, it's really based on the principle that something that leads to a contradiction cannot be true. So you've got this sentence here, Lucy is married to Sam, but Sam's not married to Lucy. Well, that doesn't make sense. That can't be true. And what that means is that the opposite must be true. So going back to here, if Lucy's married to Sam, but Sam's not married to Lucy, it makes no sense. But the opposite, well, if Sam was married to Lucy, well, that would make sense. Because you could say Lucy's married to Sam, and Sam is married to Lucy. That makes sense. That would be true. In math, then, how does that apply? Well, first of all, what you do is you assume the negation statement to be true. And negation statements were something that we looked at in the last lesson. By a series of steps, we will go through our proof and we will hopefully arrive at a contradiction. What that means, then, is that if you arrive at a contradiction, then the negation statement will be false. Bum, bum, bum. And if the negation statement is false, then that would mean that the original statement will be true. Let's try this with a few examples after I give you the steps. So first of all, you need to write your negation statements. So remember, if your original statement is if A then B, your negation statement will be keeping the first part the same, but it will be the opposite of the last part. So it'll be if A, then not B. So you write to your negation statement. After you write that, what you do is you attempt to prove the negation statement to be true. What you'll hopefully do is you will arrive at a contradiction. Bum, bum, bum. If you arrive at a contradiction, this means then that the negation statement will be false. And if the negation statement is false, the original statement is true. So let's move on then to example one. Example one. Prove by contradiction that if n is odd, then n cubed is odd, where n belongs to z, and z is integers. Perfect. So it says n is going to be an integer. First thing you need then is you're needing to write your negation statement. So the negation statement here will be, remember your negation statement is, if the original statement's if a then b, and your negation is if a then not b. So here, if n is odd, we're going to keep that just as it is, is. So if n is odd, then it says n cubed is odd. But for the negation statement, we will say then n cubed is even with n belonging to z once again. So we're going to be changing that last part. What we then do is we try to prove the negation statement to be true. So if n is odd, then n cubed is even. So to do that, we are going to say then, remember an odd number, you're going to have a 2 times something plus or minus 1. I'm going to choose plus 1. So n is going to equal 2k plus 1. We're wanting to find out then if n cubed is even. We're wanting to try and prove that. So n cubed is going to equal the 2k plus 1 all cubed. To cube that, you could multiply out the brackets by doing 2k plus 1 times 2k plus 1. Whatever you get, multiply that by another 2k plus 1. Or if you think back to a previous chapter, you could also use your binomial theorem. 
Yeah, perfect. You can use your binomial theorem. So, quick recap for your binomial theorem. Think about your Pascal's triangle with 1, 1, 1. Then the next line, add the two ones together and you will get 2. On the end, you finish with a 1. Again, start with a 1, add these two together and you get 3. Add these two numbers and you get 3. And this number at the end will be 1. So, you're wanting to use this rule here because it's to the power of 3. You go down to the 1, 3. You're going to have the coefficients 1, 3, 3, and 1. So you'd have 1, 3, 3, and 1. You've got 2k. You have that to the power of 3, then 2, then 1, then 0. So you're not bothering to write it. And then the 1, you're having that to the power of 0. So again, not bothering to write that. Then 1 to the power of 1, 1 to the power of 2, and 1 to the power of 3. Look back to binomial theorem if you're unsure about this part. If you cube the 2k, then you will end up with 8k cubed. Simplifying all this will give you 12k squared. Simplify this and you will end up with 6k. And on the end, you've obviously just got a 1. Where do you go from there? Well, in order to attempt to prove that it's going to be even, well, let's take out 2 as a common factor. So let's take out 2 and the way you will end up with 2 times the 4k cubed plus 2 times the 6k squared, would give us a 12k squared, and then 2 times the 3k. However, because you've got 1 on the end, you cannot take out 2 as a common factor without going into decimals. So let's just close our bracket and let's leave the plus 1 just on the end. What you'll notice is that because we have 2 times something plus 1, well, we're just going to replace that 4k cubed plus 6k squared plus 3k with the letter A. Because we know this here is just going to be an integer. So it's going to be 2 times some integer, just calling it A. And then you've got a plus 1. But because we have that, well, we know that is going to be odd. It's in the form of 2 times something plus or minus 1. That is odd. What we had, though, for the negation statement is if n is odd, then n cubed is even. But we're getting it to be odd. Bam, bam, bam. What this means is we've arrived at a contradiction. We are contradicting this negation statement. So we can say then that therefore n cubed is odd for all odd n. And this is a contradiction. So the negation statement is false. Because we're contradicting the negation statement, it is false. And that means then the original statement, if n is odd, then n cubed is odd, will be true. So we've arrived at a contradiction. The negation statement is therefore false, and the original statement will be true. Woo! Let's try another one. Example 2, prove by contradiction that if p is a rational number and q is an irrational number, then p plus q is an irrational number. So the first thing that you need, again, we've got the little steps here. First thing you want to do is to write your negation statement. So remember, if your original statement is if a then b, then your negational statement will be if a then not b. So the first part we want to keep just as it is. So if p is a rational number and q is an irrational number, we would just want to keep that. The second part says then p plus q is an irrational number. So if we take the opposite of that, we will then say for the negation statement that then p plus q is a rational number. Bum, bum, bum. What we then do is attempt to prove the negation statement to be true. So we're wanting to try and prove this negation statement. Well, we're saying that p plus q is a rational number. So let's think about that. If p plus q is a rational number, well, what that means then is that p plus q can be written as a fraction. So you could write it as a over b, just for some integers a and b. So p plus q is rational, so we can express that as a fraction. What that means is, well, if we rearrange this, we could have q in its own. If we subtract p from both sides, we could say q would equal a over b, take away p. So that is us getting q. And the reason we're doing that is because with p, we are told that p is a rational number. It's saying here p is a rational number, which means then if p is rational, p can also be written as a fraction. So we can therefore say that q would equal a over b take away. And if we write p as a fraction, we could have that as c over d, just for some integers, c and d. So we're doing that because p is rational. Therefore, what we can do is if we subtract these fractions, so multiply the fraction on the left by d, 
top and bottom, multiply a fraction and the uh, rate by B, top and bottom, and then subtract because the numerators will be the same, you will end up with AD take away BC over BD. However, if you think about that, remember what you want to do is you want to arrive at a contradiction, which we have done. Why is that? Perfect, because what we have is Q written as a fraction. And if Q is written as a fraction, well, that means it's going to be rational. But it's saying up here that Q is an irrational number. Bum, bum, bum. So we are contradicting ourselves. So this implies that Q is rational because it's written as a fraction, which is a contradiction to the negation statement. What that means then is that the negation statement cannot be true. The negation statement is false. And if the negation statement is false, what does that say about the original statement? It's true. That is right. The original statement will be true. Yeah. Woo. Example three, prove by contradiction that, that root two is irrational. Once again, if we're using proof by contradiction, we want to start off writing the negation statement. So here we're told that root two is irrational. Well, really you want to take the negation of that and the opposite of root two being irrational would be that root two is rational. So that there would be your negation statement for that statement. So assume that root two is rational. Well, if root two is rational, what does rational mean? It can be written as a fraction. Well done, it means that root two can be written as a fraction. So we're going to say then that root two would equal, let's say m over n, where m and n are going to be integers. What we can also say is that there will be no common factor. So it could be written as a fraction that could be simplified right the way down. So root two would equal m over n, where m and n have no common factors. So starting off with this then, so root two equals m over n, what we could do is we could square both sides. So squaring both sides will give us, well, if we square the square root, that will just give us, they'll cancel out, leaving us with two, and that would equal m squared over n squared. Rearranging that, we could have m squared equals 2n squared by multiplying both sides by n squared. If we have m squared equals two times something, well, what that means is that m squared must be an even number. And something else we have looked at in this chapter of m squared is even. Well, if m squared is even, then it means that m is also an even number. So if m is even, let's let m equal two times something. So we're gonna say it equals 2k, where k is an integer. Going over the page, so m would equal 2k, we just had that, which means then if we start going back the way, well, m squared would equal, well, it's going to be 2k all squared. And 2k all squared is equal to 4k squared. If we go back to the line where we've got m squared equals 2n squared, if you look a few lines above that, m squared equals 2n squared, well, what we can do is we can replace the m squared with 4k squared. So we end up with the 2n squared equals that 4k squared. All I've done is I've just subbed it in here, so 4k squared equals 2n squared, and then just swapped the sides, just written it back to front. What that means is, if you divide both sides by 2, you will have n squared equals 2k squared, which means then that because you can write n squared as 2 times something, well, it means that n squared is even. And once again, if n squared is even, well, it means that n will also be even. However, what we've also got in the last page, if you remember, we said that m was even. So we've got n to be even and m to be even, which means they're both going to be even numbers. But if we have that, well, that really contradicts our negation statement because with the negation statement, what we had was, well, we assumed that root 2 would be rational, which meant that we could write it as a fraction and m and n have no common factors. But if they are both even numbers, well, they will have a common factor. They've got a common factor of 2. So that is a contradiction. And if we've just arrived at a contradiction, then it means the negation statement will be false. And root two cannot be expressed as m over n, which means it cannot be a rational number. And if the negation statement is false, what does that mean about the original statement? It's true. Perfect. So the original statement will be true and root two is an irrational number. 
Woo! Try these questions in the Unit 3 booklet on page 84. Check your answers as you go. If you have any problems, let me know. Best of luck. Have fun. Remember to use these steps as you go through the proof by contradiction. Yeah. See ya.